Hello, everybody. How are my University of the East students doing? Hmm? Especially this group. This is the public speaking. Wow, wow. Right. So hope everybody's doing okay. This is scheduled for week four. Hmm? Week four. Remember, we had Columbus Day as a holiday. So this is only for week four, which um, you know, if I look at the schedule, maybe the third, maybe of uh, November. Can you believe it? That means Halloween will be over. I'm going to wish everybody a happy Halloween first. Uh, don't get into trouble. If you're going to wear a costume, wear a costume, but don't get into trouble. You know, these people outside, they constantly make noise. They have no control. So sorry for that noise from outside. I think they're stealing my car. That's what they're doing. So I won't pay attention to that. But, uh, you know, there's just some people, they're noisy people. They don't, you tell them, hey, could you not make noise? Ah! And then they just make noise. So anyway, you mark this uh, time down. So. Hopefully you're learning a lot in the public speaking and realizing that you can transfer these skills to your job or just your everyday living, right? You can do this, that's very helpful when we're talking about poise, remember that big word poise, right? An ability to talk to people. It's not only in a speech environment, right? So uh, today's, uh, the original lesson that I picked is a little short, so I had to mix it with another one. So we're going to go through uh, two different topics. But again, I chose them because they're very helpful, not only in giving a speech, but in giving you personal skills that will help you maybe acquire a job, uh, keep your job, advance, or just dealing with people in general, right? So as I say, Without further ado or adieu, right? Yeah, share the screen. Go over here. Let me get rid of myself here. Goodbye. Bye. There we go. Okay. That's done. So I guess I'll. Start the slideshow, go to the from the beginning. So if I didn't mention the school code before, it's ENG 105. Uh, a couple of you might also have my ENG 106, but that's cross-cultural communication. So this is uh, public speaking, AKA speech class. All right, week four. So. You know, hopefully those ghosts don't come back today, make trouble. Uh, God, I just, you know, if it's not the people outside stealing my car, it's the ghosts inside my apartment. I don't know what to do. So anyway, uh, here, here we have a big strange word, impromptu. So impromptu speaking. Okay, what that means is when you have to speak, when you're not planned to, or you're not ready to. That's what impromptu speaking means. Now, obviously this is a Zoom class. And, uh, so we're gonna go for the technical uh, nuts and bolts and understanding of giving a speech, but you guys don't have to give a speech in front of me. If this, was a class in person, that's a different story. And what happens a lot is, uh, you know, most of the teachers will say, okay, uh, we're gonna start from the attendance sheet. And usually, <coughs> excuse me, that's in uh, alphabetical order, right? So whoever has a last name with A or B or C, they go first. So. What happens a lot is, uh, let's say, you know, I, I don't know if it's true, but once in a while, 
I'll get a lazy student. They know maybe their last name begins with a D. So they're like, oh, okay, we have an A, and then I think we have one B and a C. So I'm going to be fourth. I'm not even going to practice my speech the night before. And then tomorrow, I'll just come to class and I'll, I can practice it and look at my notes because I have three speakers in front of me, right? And then what happens is one speaker's absent, two speakers are late. So the teacher just goes down the list and says, you know, last names beginning with A, B, and C are not here. It's D, boom. The student has to do it impromptu right now, baby. No time to, oh, you know, I think I have to go to the restroom. Sorry, the restroom is locked. So that's what impromptu means, okay? So let's get into some techniques here, okay? If you're like most people, there are few utterances. Utterances is an old term for something that is said. I, I have not heard this term in over 20 years, but it used to be, you know, you'd get an older person and they would say, did you utter something? And I'd say, oh, did I order a cheeseburger? What? Oh, utter. So I don't hear it anymore, but you'll still see it in writing. So it means there are a few utterances, a few, uh, a few things that people say that strike more fear into your heart than to be sitting in an audience and suddenly realize that the master of ceremonies sentence that began with, and now a few words from, which means this certain student's gonna have to speak, actually ended with your name. So without all these fancy words, the same situation, you go to class, I got four people, before me, I'm going to stop at Starbucks. I'll get in there and start paying attention. After I drink the coffee, I'll wake up. And like I said, one student's absent, two students are late. They have to begin the class. They have to get everybody in to do the speeches. It's you, baby. You're the, and now a few words from you. You've got to be ready. So it's impromptu, okay? So we're going to get into some techniques you can do to hopefully save yourself when you think you actually don't have the ability to save yourself. So we're right here. The prospect or situation of impromptu presentations often paralyzes, oh, I'm frozen, <laughs> paralyzed with fear, even the seasoned speaker. So that means even the veteran speaker that's been speaking for quite a while. It scares them too. Everybody's human. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't at all mind having to make a few unplanned remarks. Yeah, you shouldn't mind. That's what I tell my students. You shouldn't mind, but they mind. Okay, here's some other old stuff nobody uses anymore. Harken back. It says harken back to chapter one which means <clears throat> go back, or in our case, remember back in chapter one, the right topic, okay? That's what that means. You will realize that all the necessary elements for a successful talk are present in an impromptu speaking situation. So you say, how's that possible? They told me I got to speak now and I only got a few minutes to get my notes together. You can still do it, right? As long as you pay attention in class and did your assignments, right? So think for a moment about the settings or situations in which you're likely to be unexpectedly asked to say a few words. The most common of these situations are those in which you have some personal experiences you can draw on, <coughs> draw on or count on, such as weddings and retirement parties. And these happen 
you're at a wedding and then suddenly the groom says, I, I need uh, Pamela Titan to come up here and talk about my wife. Uh huh? You gotta come up there, say something good, hopefully Pamela, not bad, okay? And then retirement parties too. You've worked with some folks for many, many years. They want you to go up there and say something nice about themselves, right? Okay. The next most common is when you're attending a meeting, as a work meeting, a business meeting. You'd hardly be at the meeting if you had no interest in the topic being discussed. So that means definitely you are interested. As a matter of fact, you probably have a keen or big interest in the subject. Accordingly, you are clearly knowledgeable enough to be able to say a few words. They're not asking you to speak for 30 minutes or an hour to say a few words. But what about the other two criteria for a can't fail talk? Caring about the subject and wanting to talk about it. You probably do have feelings about the topic. A friend being married, a colleague being honored, or a point on which you have strong views. Yes, I believe we should all have free kimchi in the United States. That's a strong view I have, but I don't even think I can get free kimchi in Korea unless I join the army. So that's what Mr. Hong told me. As for wanting to talk about it, any impromptu speaking situation, you'll probably gladly have something to say. Even if you don't, it should be pretty easy for you to rationalize wanting to see rationalize which means you have to say it's okay so that's a skill you should learn you have to rationalize to survive in life for example okay guys I'll talk to the guys uh, You're in love, this beautiful woman. You wanna marry her and she breaks up with you because she found a guy that has more money. She was secretly dating him too. So she breaks your heart and you just, you just wanna quit, that's it, it's over. But to survive so you don't become an alcoholic, become so depressed you lose your job you have to go forward you're gonna have to rationalize it right and say okay what's the actual best thing out of this situation so obviously you're hurt she's beautiful nobody likes to be dumped you know and the guy's got more money or whatever so she's thinking she's doing the best thing for herself but the way to rationalize it and save your mind and go forward is the correct way and say, well, it's better she did this to me now than before we got married, because then it would be very di more difficult and more expensive to the man. So you don't like the situation, but you realize, whew, it's better she did this now instead of after being married for five years, maybe we had a kid involved, you know, and she would have done the same thing. Oh, I'm tired of being with you and I deserve a man with more money. Bingo, bongo, bango, she divorces. So you have to rationalize and say, I actually got saved. So I'll use that to get over the love that I had for her and her beauty that just made me crazy and climb trees and jump into rivers, okay? So you have to rationalize. You wouldn't want to disappoint a friend or coworker, and you shouldn't want to pass up an opportunity 
to make your views known to your colleagues or workmates about a subject you care about. And that seems to be what all these American people are doing now. Oh, you know, you have to be kind to the insects or you have to do this or you, you have to forgive a, a homeless people for, you know, burning your car. So I care about this subject. You go. Let's move on. <clears throat> there were two other reasons why you should never be too upset about having a few impromptu remarks. First, masters of ceremonies really mean it when they say a few words. That means they want you to do it quickly. I mean, you could be the drunk guy and get up there and you want to talk for 30 minutes. That's not what they want. Second, the audience expectations in these circumstances aren't too high, right? They don't know who you are. And even if they do, oh, was that the best man? Or that's one of the bride's grooms. So they're expecting you to say, he's a great guy. <laughs> Known him for 10 years. I'm so happy for him. Raise a glass. And that, you know, that's all they're saying, all they're waiting for. They're not expecting you to go up there and be Robert De Niro and start doing this great acting show. So we're right here. So, so, so. So you really have to speak for more than, uh, more than a minute or two. And you can succeed nicely by telling a story about the friend who's getting married or retiring. Yeah, that's a, that's a secret. That's a surefire a success, just tell a story. And sometimes you can lie about it because the audience won't know. Maybe the groom later will tell you, what was that story, man? It never happened. It's okay, I was nervous, take it, you know. So telling a story is cool. At a meeting, making one point backed up with a couple of examples as to why you feel this will do nicely. But what do you do when hearing your name called paralyzes your brain? No, I can't handle it. There are two effective methods for gracefully handling the situation. One will work almost all the time and the other will work all the time. Oh, wow, what could this be? Should I be charging you guys? Before I tell you this information, like $50 each, that would pay for a nice plane ticket, except I can't go anywhere because of COVID and Disneyland's not open. Shoot. Okay. Maybe it'll buy a lot of kimchi. Um, you may forget about <coughs> or neglect, which means don't take care of the foolproof, which means like a guarantee method. And we'll have to fall back on the almost proof one. We'll deal with the latter, which means the second one first. Remember that in any impromptu speaking situation, you will have enough knowledge of the topic to enable you to say something. You will very likely care in some way about the subject, and you can easily rationalize wanting to say a few words. So, all the elements for a successful talk are there. Yeah, if your friend's getting married, you know enough to say something about him. You can't go up there and say, I've been his friend for 15 years. I, I, don't, I don't even know his name. You can't do that. Right? And if you're at a business meeting, obviously it's a subject that your company is involved with. So, you know, just do the normal, A. Hey, the... Uh, The work is great, the components are fantastic. Great people working here, thank you, that's it, right? So again, all the elements for a successful talk are there. Continuing, you will always have a few moments to organize your thoughts. So ask, when are these moments? What? First, by stalling a bit with a who me reaction. 
Now, let me explain this carefully. What they say, okay, you know, uh, Mr. A is uh, absent. He, he sent a text. Uh, both of his tires, uh, or all four of his tires blew out on the freeway and uh, the car went into the ocean. So he texted from the ocean and he's not coming in. And then it, it, we got texts from the other two, uh, B and C, Mr. B and Mrs. C, and they're stuck in a giant uh, traffic jam on the 405. So that's when they come to you, Mr. D. So when you do, you can do this, you stall. Stall means like wasting time. You can say, huh, uh, me, who? Why? But when you're saying those things, your mind is working and going over your speech, okay? Then you can create even more thinking time by slowly <coughs> making your way to the podium, which we also call the lectern, which is the horizontal piece of wood that the speakers stand behind or in front of the room. And you can always pause, wait for a few more seconds when you get there. So what they're saying is tell them, oh, oh, you're calling on me. Let me get my notes together. So that gives you some time. And while you're getting your notes together, you look at them and go over the speech in your mind. And then as you walk to the podium or lectern, don't walk fast, walk as slow as you can, right? And as you're walking as slow as you can to the front, when you get there, you can also say, excuse me, let me adjust this area and take even more minutes, to get it ready. Put your papers up there, put them in order, put your phone down, whatever it takes. But all this time you're going over the speech or actually looking at your notes, your mind. So these are all just not lost time. There are breaks and issues where you can actually, you know, uh, as we call cram the study right there of the speech. We're right here during this time, ask yourself, what can I say about this person or topic? Usually expanding on the first thought that comes into your mind is all you need to do. Is it really that easy? Let's find out. If it's a person, the wedding or retirement party examples, you'll probably think of something that happened to at least two people in the room. Just tell that story by answering the classic journalistic questions. What happened? Who was involved? Why did it happen? When did it happen? Where did it happen? How did it happen? So maybe you can say a little like the old Hangover movie. That movie was all about stories. They lost the one guy, he found him on the roof of the casino and they're chasing other things and uh, stole Mike Tyson's tiger. And so if you got a buddy, for a number of years, you can say a story, right? All right, next. If it's a meeting, make a single point that reveals your views and back it up with an example or two, which can also take the form of a story. See, there we go back to stories. As mentioned earlier, you must have some interest or views on the subject or you wouldn't be at the meeting. So, I mean, let's say you didn't have interest, but it's your company meeting. Well, you have views on it because you know about it through your company. You can buy some time, which means, you know, waste some time if necessary by asking a clarifying question or two, exactly. If you want to get more to the point of what they want to hear, you know, you can ask why. Now, the bottom here, to the foolproof method, and foolproof means it's guaranteed, right? It's a foolproof, nothing will 
Nothing can go wrong. Uh, the foolproof method, which is quite simple, but requires a little bit of work, which is the reason most people don't use it. See? Oh, it's a little bit of work. I don't want to do it. That's not my students. My students want to work hard, like Temujin, Pamela, Caroline. Anytime you're going to be in a situation where there is the possibility of being asked to say a few words, decide beforehand what you would say should the occasion rise, arise. So you try to think beforehand, what would happen? What should I say? Otherwise, you're lost. So for example, if you're going to a wedding reception or a retirement party, go over in your mind what story or stories you will tell if asked to speak, but keep them clean. Don't make them dirty. You know, don't do that. Uh, that's my personal advice. <laughs> if you're going to a meeting, Look over the agenda and that's the what's planned for the day and clarify your points on each item. You know, it, the agenda might say something like, going over the uh, profit margin of the company, going over the loss margin, going over the new recruits. So look that over and whatever area you have the most knowledge with, um, that's what I would talk about. That's what, you know, it's just like when you, have a well you can apply it with a speech if you if you have to decide between two speeches right you're 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 telling yourself i want to do a speech either on hamburgers or hot dogs right like and then you narrow the topic to uh i want to talk about the best the best hamburgers in la or do I want to talk about the best hot dogs? My advice to you is go with where you have the most information. That'll give you more to talk about. <laughs> you, let's say, so that's an easy choice. I would look at that and say, okay, hot dogs. Uh, LA, most people jump around about pinks. You know, I, I don't personally like pinks, but I don't live far and there's always a big line. So people are going to say pinks, uh, maybe der Wiener schnitzel. And I don't even know which fast food would come in number three. Those are the only two I really know. Now compare two fast food places to Wendy's, Burger King. McDonald's, in and out five guys, okay? Uh, Jack in the box, okay? So that already, those are six hamburger fast food establishments versus two hot dogs, right? Two hot dog establishments. Pinks and uh, for Wiener Schmitz. So, where do you think you could get more information? Sure, with the six hamburger places. So that's how you choose, which gives you the most uh, most information. And that's what you would talk about in an impromptu situation. So, although it's perfectly all right to jot down, which means write down quickly a few notes don't refer to them 
when speaking. Okay, this is a psychological technique. I'll, I'll read a little further and then I'll explain it to you. This would spoil or ruin or even destroy the spontaneity of the occasion. And spontaneity means the ability to do something spontaneously or without planning, right? So again, when I make these silly examples are to make it silly so it's easy to understand. Uh, what I've been told, I don't know because I've never kissed a girl in my life. My mother told me not to. So I'm still obeying my mother. Uh, girls or women like a kiss when it's spontaneous. They don't want a guy to sit there <coughs> during the dinner and say, you know, I've been thinking I would like to kiss you. So can I kiss you an hour after we finish dinner? Uh, so I've been told women don't like that technique, right? They'd rather be relaxing with you, watching a movie, whatever, and then you spontaneously without making an appointment on the schedule and you just give her a kiss, all right? So, as far as the speech goes, to let you know, this would spoil the spontaneity of the occasion. Raise the audience's expectations and very likely reduce their appreciation of your ability to think on your feet. Wow, that's a mouthful. I got to go through that. Hopefully the kissing example will help you. What this means is, um, uh, an audience will, well, I want to use the, the, the English slang, which is cut you some slack, but you might not understand what that means. So to define it, uh, when you give a speech, people already kind of know that you're nervous. Everyone's going to be nervous. You're going to go and say something, even if it's only for a few words. So they kind of have compassion for you, right? And don't expect a lot about it. They expect you to say something funny and spontaneous. But if you stop and, as it says, shot down a few notes, and if you start talking from these notes, this kind of spoils their sympathy for you. And subconsciously, now they think, okay, this guy knows something or he's planned to speak. So now they expect something really important from you. And if you don't give that, then they're disappointed, right? This will reduce their appreciation of your ability to think on your feet. So even that kind of says like, is this guy cheating or, you know? So just be yourself, be funny. Don't worry about it and say what you know. And the people will have compassion for you and say, good guy. He said a couple of nice things and they just asked him suddenly and he only gave him a few minutes. Good for you. You know, he's not an expert or, you know, he's not cheating. So that's what all that gobbledygook means in there, right? Now I'm try tired trying to translate it. Okay, so let's go to our famous nutshell. What's inside the nutshell? No nuts. Number one, being unexpectedly asked to say a few words can happen anytime you're in a group of people, but rarely when you aren't perfectly qualified and prepared to comply. What that means is, you know, you're at a business meeting or even at a wedding, even though they just come up to you, hey, yo-yo, uh, say a few words about the, the man that's getting married or, hey, you, ye, ye, get up and talk a little about the company since you've worked there for a year. So you're qualified with your experience at work. 
or your friendship with your buddy, you can say anything and nobody expects anything high level from you. So don't make yourself more worried than what you have to be, okay? Two, a few words. It's literally all that's wanted from you. So you only have to speak for a minute or two to fulfill your obligation. So don't forget that. A few words. Short means a short amount of time. Again, you don't want to be the drunk guy that gets up there and never stops talking. People have to say, you've been talking too long now, buddy. Right? So relax. And no, you don't have to talk for a long time. Three, the expectations of the audience. In these circumstances aren't very high. So that should tell you there isn't a lot of pressure on you. So be happy about that. You're, you have not been picked by your boss to do the hour speech to impress the new company next week in front of 100 people you've never met. Not at all. You just got to do a short couple of minutes. That's it. Four. All impromptu speaking requirements can be met by telling a story or making a single point. Making a single point makes it easy to concentrate. A story makes it easy to say something that you know well and is possibly very funny. Just ask yourself, what can I say about this person or this topic? And then expand on the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, there you go. But again, keep it clean. Don't say, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Oh, I stepped over my buddy's house last week and he got drunk and he walked around with no clothes on. You might not want to say that story, okay? Even though it's the freshest one in your mind. Five. Anytime you're going to be in a situation where there's even the remotest, which means slimmest, farthest chance of having to say a few words, give some thought to what you will say if asked. So that's just telling you to always be prepared because you never know, even if you think you're safe. You know, you're the new guy at the company You've only been there a few months. You know, everybody else has been there for years. So you say, I don't have to worry about this. They're not going to ask me. I don't know enough about the company. And like I said before, bingo, bango, bongo. Suddenly the boss says, I want you guys to listen to our newest employees. Only been here barely three months. And let's hear what a new guy's perspective here. And then you sit there, no, inside your mind because you're paralyzed with fear. So always go with something practiced in your mind. Just a few words. It's an insurance policy. You know, <laughs> say, God forbid, if they ask me, what am I going to say, you know? Like somebody might just ask me, <clears throat> okay, so we want you to talk about your time in uh, prison in China. You know? And I'm like, huh? What? Uh, oh, because I, I did spend time in, in uh, prison in China. I, I, I kissed a lady in Shanghai and she called the police. So I had to spend a year in Lao Gai in prison. But I don't expect them to ask me. But if they do, I gotta have something to say. So always be ready. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. So, like I said, today is a two-parter. 
because they're both not long enough on their own. So the first one was impromptu speaking. So here's some other techniques. And again, you can add these for yourself, you know, in your life. It's not just only for uh, being good at giving speeches. Again, that's a point, you know, you should make in all the things that you study. You have to say, Hmm, how can I apply or can I apply what I'm learning here to uh, other aspects of my life? Is that possible? So that's what you should do here. You know, so just don't think, oh, okay, how do I become a more interesting speaker? You could be a more interesting person, right? And that might get you a job or promote you in the job or get you that new girlfriend, right? All right, so here we go. Uh, becoming a more interesting speaker. No matter how experienced and comfortable you become in front of groups, there is always room to become an even more interesting speaker. So you can always learn more. You can always get better. Don't think you've reached the pinnacle or the top. Broadening your horizons, or sometimes they use expanding, developing, which means your horizons, your future, and interest. So the more interest you have, will enhance or improve the knowledge and skills you already possess and help you acquire new beneficial ones. See? And of course, you need to approach everything you do with the right mental attitude. You can't have a negative one. It's got to be a positive one. Knowledge. Nice heading there. There are three ways to acquire knowledge. That sounds like a good question on the mentor. Okay. <clears throat> there are three ways to acquire knowledge. Study is one. Experience is the other being around people who know more than you do. All three methods are useful, but the most efficient is study. Reading is to the mind what exercise is to the body. Those who don't read are no better off than those who can't read. Okay, so that's about, I just want to make a distinction here. That's about really, really improving your, like your vocabulary and sounding like a more educated speaker. But remember, I've told you guys, if it comes down to choosing your speech, uh, <clears throat> if you study, you have to study a lot to know a lot. But if you're nervous and you pick a topic <clears throat> that you have to study too much or you don't feel comfortable conveying experience in your own life. That's why I always tell first time speakers to do a speech about themselves, their mother, their family, something they know. And nobody's more of an expert than you about yourself. But again, you want to become a more interesting speaker. In this case, the more you read, the better vocabulary you get, the more things you learn about uh, in life. And these things help you. Okay, here, a sure way to become a boring person, and by extension, a boring speaker, is to be interested only in your work. So whatever your work is, if your work's about balloons, and that's all you're really interested about and enjoy talking about is balloons, 
won't be a well-rounded speaker. To be a better informed and more interesting person and speaker, at least one quarter of your reading should be outside your occupational field. So what they're trying to say is if you can read outside these other things and you can maybe relate them to your work, it sounds much better than just, you know, like hitting someone over the head with a hammer. Balloons, 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 right? This will help you enormously in developing appropriate analogies and illustrations for your talk. So analogy is when you compare one thing to another. And an illustration is when you show something. So learning about something else can really help you understand more your own field. And people love to hear analogies. So like uh, a lot of guys, uh, we don't have the mandatory draft here anymore, but like Korea does. Uh, they will say something like, wow, my, my two and a half years in the Korean army was like being in prison, right? They compare it to prison and people say, oh, why is that? You know, no freedom, can't travel, have to live with a bunch of other men, <laughs> exercise in the morning, do whatever the sergeants tell us, just like being in prison, right? You do whatever the prison guards tell you. So that's an analogy. So the more you know about other things, you can uh, compare and uh, contrast. Continuing. Experience is a wonderful teacher and yours will provide you with a store of examples that you can use as evidence in your teachers. Yes, experience is a wonderful teacher, teaches you many things. Not only hot dogs and hamburgers. Try to learn from everything that happens around you. That's why myself, unfortunately, I've worked with some teachers that think they're like a, oh, I don't know, a king or a queen. And when they go teach, they're like, well, I don't really respect the students. They can't speak English well, so they have to listen to me. I think that's very foolish. I've gotten into arguments with some of these teachers and said, hey, just because your English is better than, let's say, this one student in class, you don't know if that student is a scientist. So not only can they speak their own language and they're learning English, but they're a scientist, something you don't have the intelligence to be. Or maybe they speak four other languages and English is going to be five. So I respect my students and I always try to learn from them too. Okay. But that's a secret. Don't tell Inkujin uh, or Munkara or even Rie. Those girls will get tough. So again, a good point is try to learn from everything that happens around you. Make notes of interesting observations, opinions, quotations, those are quotes, and statistics. And develop a filing system that will allow you to easily find and refer to this material when you're preparing for a talk. So if people can do this on the computer or on their phone, what do they do, make folders? The old way used to be you had these little cards, little, I don't know, two by two cards, and you had a thing called a Rolodex, and you wrote the notes on there, and then the, you spun the Rolodex with your fingers. So that's the old way. That's the way I learned. Right? Same thing for the library cards now. It's a computer system. the bottom here, never put a limit on your search for knowledge. Another good thing is never stop learning. And that's what I try to do in my life. I always try to learn something, something new. So it says here, there's no such thing as an uninteresting subject. 
just disinterested people. So that's a very good quote. That's saying you offer someone to learn a new subject and they say, oh, I don't want to learn that. That sounds boring. Well, some people find it interesting. But the people who don't, maybe it's because they are just disinterested. Not that the topic is not interesting itself. So think about that. That's uh, a very interesting thing to uh, think about, right? I mean, like let's say, you know, the last five or 10 years have really been popular in the United States for people to go to chef school, cooking school, and they want to open their own restaurants and, you know, bura bura. But maybe for some people, like, I think I've got a couple of bachelor friends and they don't cook. One guy's refrigerator is all full of uh, Coca-Colas and then he orders pizza and delivery a lot. If he goes out, does he go to a nice restaurant? No, he goes to McDonald's. So for him, if you said, hey, you want to learn how to cook? He's going to say, God, that's, I'm not interested in that, but that's it. You know, it's not that he says, that's boring. No, it's not boring to learn how to cook. You're just disinterested, okay? Until you understand something completely, be open-minded about it. Become interested before you become judgmental. Judgmental is when you say, well, I don't like it. I don't want to learn about that. The person who knows how something is done can give a good speech about it. The person who knows why it is done will give a great speech. Why is it done? Don't forget that. Two areas of knowledge that you should never stop developing are your vocabulary. See, I mentioned that earlier. And your grasp or your understanding of grammar. So that's what they used to say when I was going to school was, boy, that guy has a great vocabulary or the person with the largest vocabulary will probably get the job or sound like the more interesting individual. Being able to find the precise, which means exact words and use them correctly will help enormously a lot, a lot, a lot in speech preparation and delivery. So that means you just don't use general words. You use something more precise and it really hits a point. Anytime you encounter a word that you don't know the meaning or pronunciation of, look it up in a dictionary and make it a part of your vocabulary. You should also take note of the synonyms and antonyms listed for such words. Doing crossword puzzles is a fun way to improve your vocabulary. I don't know if anybody does those anymore. Maybe they just play, well, Sudoku was popular about 10 years ago. Now it's just Candy Crush, Candy Crush. Like, uh, I think Temujin plays Candy Crush. Caroline plays Candy Crush. All right, not Le Sok. Le Sok was a soldier. It's not allowed for him to play Candy Crush. Okay, so here we go, skills. You must continually hone, that means continuously practice the skills you have through use. Right, to say if you don't practice it, if you don't do it, you lose the skill over time. While at the same time, acquiring new skills that will enhance your speaking or improve your speaking ability. Possessing or having a single talent will only take you so far and will definitely limit your scope as a speaker. So again, the situation is that your company, your boss chooses you 
as one of the speakers that are going to go out, as they say, on the circuit and speak to other companies to try to get them to buy your company's products, let's say. But all you really talk about, you know, again, is those balloons, 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 balloons. So people understand your point of view, but it's pretty boring. It's the same thing all the time. Then he, he tries another speaker and this speaker talks about the products, but has all these analogies and compares them to other things and how they can improve in different areas. This person will start being the speaker for the company and not you, okay? Because they have a bigger vocabulary. They have uh, more skills, more understanding of different things. So that's the proof in the pudding there. Possessing a single talent will only take you so far. You only talk about balloons exactly and what they do for so long. This will limit you. But here's some relief. There are three good ways to identify the skills you already possess and to discover those that may be lacking or missing. Most people don't have a problem with the first method. It's simply objectively assessing or studying what you do and don't do well. However, it's sometimes difficult to be sufficiently objective so, and it's hard. It, it is hard to be objective and look at yourself and say, uh, ah, I got to learn what my problems are, what my weak points are. I don't want to look at that. So the second method is to ask others. So you ask them, such as colleagues, bosses, and mentors for their assessments. and They will tell you easily. You don't have to study about you or, or look at a tape about yourself. Finally, and this is the method most often overlooked, you have to try new things and try doing all things in new ways. Interesting. Trying to do all things in new ways. Putting a limit on what you will do puts a limit on what you can't do or what you can do. If you try new things or doing old things in new ways, you might discover a skill that you didn't know you had and you might identify a skill that you should or would like to develop. Opportunities are never missed. Listen to that. Interesting advice. Opportunities are never missed. Other people would take advantage of those you don't. Ah, so that means they are missed from you, but other people will take that advantage. When you aren't improving, someone else is. And when you encounter that person, you will come in second. So it's like what I said over here. You just continuously talk in the same way factually about balloons. This other person is giving an analogy of balloons and kites and balloons and airplanes and changes it up, mixes it up, adds vocabulary. You will come in second to that person. People are going to want to hear what that person uh, has to say. The skills you need to acquire are often evident or obvious in your surroundings. Always ask yourself which skills would help you enhance or improve the application of your knowledge. Whatever you're going to be doing, wherever you're going to be doing it. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough that you do it but where are you gonna do it or wherever? For example, the engineer who designs a product, 
instance decides to sell it, should take some sales training. It's usually instructive to ask successful people in your field to recommend areas of improvement. Right. So again, you're the new guy at the company or the new guy on the block, as they say. You've been doing speeches pretty well for a couple of months. Ask the guys who have been doing it for years, five years, 10 years, say, hey, can you help me recommend areas I need to improve since you have such a long track record? And if they're willing to help you, you will learn, okay? It's important stuff. Always seek out those with more experience than you do. They should be able to assist you. Nothing wrong with it. You work for the same company. Mm. Next is attitude. Not only do you need to develop positive attitudes about yourself, but you also must understand the attitudes of people you deal with, especially those of your audience members. An audience is not an amorphous mass. So what they're saying is an audience is not just this big unknown mass. They're people, right? It's made up of individuals who react as individuals, right? So again, they won't all react the same even though they're from the same company. Everyone has a different way of looking at things and they're gonna react as the individuals they are. Continuing, however, we're all similar when it comes to how we want to be treated. We want to be liked and we want to feel important. Is that true, Tamuja? Want to be liked or only by talk? And we want to feel important. Yeah, I think everybody wants to feel important. Not everybody wants to be the president of the United States. But, uh, you know, you want to feel important in your own way. To become a more interesting person and speaker, you need to treat people as if you like them and find ways to sincerely make them feel important. So what they're saying here is um, if you just don't like people you haven't met before and you have to give a speech, they can tell. You get up there, yeah, how's everybody doing? I hope you're doing okay. You're saying the right things, but they can tell by your attitude. You don't feel comfortable with them. You don't respect them. So you need to treat people as if you like them and find ways to sincerely make them feel important. That always helps. There is nothing hypocritical about this. So hypocritical means, you know, this is not something you're doing just to get their confidence, right? You have to be genuine with your feeling. Yeah, you know, again, it's just like me as a teacher. I generally like people, so I like my students. I meet these new students, and right away, I give them the benefit of the doubt, and I like them. But I have worked with many teachers that have worked for a long time, and they don't like the students. I wonder why they're still teaching. Maybe they can't do anything else. But they're like, ah, oh. you, know, you can tell. You're in the break room, and... I'm thinking, okay, the break's over. I got to go back to my, my funny students. Let's get back with the lesson. And uh, the teacher's like, oh, darn it. This, that break's over. I don't want to go back to class. I don't want to teach those foolish students. So, And the students can probably tell. So you got to find a way to like your audience here. Everyone, by virtue of being human, has the right to be treated decently, means kindly. If you can't find some way to make a person feel important, at least never make them feel unimportant. So 
it's just another way of saying if you can't find a way to treat a person kindly, then at least never treat them unkindly, right? Maybe just don't deal with them, okay? When you develop the right attitude toward other people, you will carry it over in your role as a speaker. You will understand and relate to your audiences more effectively. And that's correct as you give them the feeling, obviously, that you like them, you can start relating to them and really look at the emotions they display. You'll become a more effective speaker. And it has been said that audiences have a keen sense of how you feel about them. Yes, they do. You can't start a speech and say, well, uh, my boss asked me to talk to you guys, but I don't really have a lot of respect for your company or you guys are usually not as smart as we are. Boy, you're in trouble at that point. Definitely. Continuing many years ago, there was a Ripley's Believe It or Not cartoon depicting, which means showing, an ordinary iron bar worth about $5. So remember the show, Ripley's Believe It or Not. The cartoon then pointed out that the iron bar made into horseshoes would be worth about $10 only. Made into sewing needles, it would be worth $3,285. If it was turned into balance springs or watches, remember the iron, it would be worth $250,000, an increase of 50,000%. Knowledge and skills are very much like that iron bar. They're worth only what you do with them. You got that? You do it at a low level, you're gonna get 10 bucks. You do it at a much better level, 3,285, you know? You do it at the highest level, 250,000, okay? So again, any knowledge and skills are very much like that iron bar. They're worth only what you do with them. So we're at the bottom here, back to Mr. Nutshell. Hello, Mr. Nutshell. Uh, one. Continually expand your skills and knowledge base, particularly your vocabulary and grammar. Again, that's very important. The more you can vary the words in your speech, the better off you will be. You know, you don't always say, exactly, 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 you say, exactly. Correctly, surely, right? And people can see you have a larger vocabulary. Two, at least one quarter of your reading should be outside your field of work. Again, you're trying to acquire new knowledge, broaden your horizons. This will help you develop appropriate analogies. Remember the prison to army analogy I gave you. Examples and illustrations for your talks. Three, be observant. Try to learn from everything that goes on around you. Yes, do that. A lot of people do not, but the more you watch, the more you can learn. You know, I'll just give you some advice on things. Uh, they say the smartest young actors 
like the uh, veterans will tell you, you know, the, the young actor is popular for whatever, let's say a TV show or this actor has done a movie or two and they're the flavor of the month, very hot. So the older actor will tell you, I was in the same situation. I was pretty popular for three years, four years. And then they found new people that were popular and I kind of drifted away. <sighs> and my career kind of didn't go anywhere after that. So they'll tell you the ones that were smart were the young actors that when they weren't filming their scenes, again, on TV or movies, they would watch and learn from the cameraman, from the director, and learn everything else they could about the filming process. So their popularity and people change their mind all the time. I remember when Beverly Hills 90210 was the big hot thing. How many years has that been gone? Right? Even Dylan is dead, the actor. So the ones that learned from that, they easily transitioned to, they were directing shows, they were producing shows. And they stayed in Hollywood. They weren't in front of the camera, but they were in the back. And the other ones that didn't learn, they made a lot of money for two, three, four years. And after that, nobody was hiring them anymore. So very important, try to learn from everything that goes on around you. Four, make extensive notes. This is very helpful. So look at your notes. Gives you a wide knowledge base. Five, develop a filing system that will allow you to easily find and refer to your notes. Again, my old thing, what I grew up with was the Rolodex. You guys easily have a computer file where you can do that on the folder. Six, there's no such thing as an uninteresting subject, just disinterested people. So to your benefit, I advise you, find a subject that you don't think is interesting and just learn about it anyway. And I promise you that a lot of times it's interesting when you're done reading about it. Of course, not before. Seven, be open-minded. Become interested before you become judgmental. And this connects to six. You can't start something without being open-minded at first. You can't start, this is crap. Why am I learning this? Oh my God. You won't get anywhere. Don't judge it first. Eight, try to do new things and doing old things in new ways. This is a way of keeping your skills fresh, right? And you always try something new. You're going to struggle with it. And then, hey, why don't I do the things that I've been doing the old way many years and try to do them in a different way and see how your pers mental perspective changes. Nine. Learn how to understand people. At least try to understand people in many different ways. Like uh, me, for example. Uh, a lot of times when I, when I was first teaching in K-Town and other schools, a lot of teachers didn't want brand new students from, let's say, uh, Korea or Japan. They wanted someone that had studied, you know, students that had studied for a few years and they could at least talk. And they just wanted to have like a conversation class, right? They didn't want to really have to teach, oh my God, grammar and uh, vocabulary acquisition and sentence structure and past tense and future tense. So, but I got stuck with doing this stuff and I didn't mind doing it. So, when I got students that were really struggling, when I used to travel, when it was available, we can't travel now with COVID, plus I had more uh, money and free time then, I would go to many countries and just hit the street and I didn't speak the language. And this helped me understand my students who came here if they didn't speak 
uh, English, you know, under 10%, and they have to kind of struggle to get around. So I did the same thing, and it gave me a lot of respect, and that's why I have patience too. You know, these students that come in and say, Mola, or, you know, Nani, I just say, okay, cool. I'll take it slower, and we'll do it this way, and get you guys to understanding just the same. So try to learn how to understand people in many different ways, okay? And remember that an audience is not an amorphous mass of some just glued together mass of people. It's made up of individuals who react as individuals. Everybody might have a different way of looking at what you're presenting or saying. So remember that. 11, always consider your audience's point of view. Think about it, you might not like it. You might not agree with it, but consider it, okay? This will help you again with the understanding. 12, your knowledge and skills are worth only what you do with them. This goes back to the monetary amounts they were assigning there, right? From the metal, the iron bar, to the different ways you utilize them, means how much money you can possibly get. So don't forget that. Reach high with your skills. Don't only try to reach low. Now, before I let you go, if you guys have your uh, fall quarter schedule at International University of the East, there's a police chasing Caroline and uh, Pamela again. They're stealing those cars. I hope they don't get caught. It wasn't me who called the police. My gosh, fast. So if you look at your fall schedule, it says, uh, the week of October 27th through November 2nd is uh, midterm, okay? But for me, like today, this is only our fourth lesson. We missed a week because of a holiday. Columbus or Indigenous Peoples Day. So um, I will not be giving the test next week, the midterm. Hopefully I'll go over some questions, a little review at the end. Um, and then I'll schedule the test for uh, the following week. So let me look here. If we were on what is said here, then our test would be uh, the, well, actually it's a 27th through. So 27th is a Tuesday. Good thing I'm going over this with you guys. Ah, okay. So this lesson is for the 26th. We're a Monday class. So you'll get it. And then the following week will be the midterm on, as I look at the schedule, Monday the 2nd. So I guess we can do it that way, okay? So in that case, I've looked at all the people who've turned in their work so far, like Carolyn and Pamela just started, uh, Rie, Muntaran, Lesak, and all the stuff looks good, right? It looks good. There's no big funky errors. So no need to do a review. Plus I'm not dealing with you face to face. So since everybody's doing good, you know, uh, that's fantastic. So I guess we will have the midterm on the November the 2nd. Monday, okay? I guess that's what we'll do. We can still do it. So don't worry. 
You're doing fine. Uh, Caroline, you do a great job, so don't worry. All right. So uh, that being said, I will let you go. Again, this is the fourth week for you guys. Uh, I will talk to you for next week, the fifth or the second. Hmm. Okay, so I can give you the test on the fifth week. Okay, sounds good. All right, so I will talk to you guys later. Bye bye. The new share. Okay, stop share. And um, that's it.